How can the death of Jesus be a Good Friday? It's Passion Week, and in just a few days, Christians all around the world will reflect and remember one of the most horrific days in history, the day when Jesus, the perfect, sinless Son of God, was beaten, mocked, tortured, shamed, and sentenced to one of the most painful deaths ever invented by man. So that begs the question, why call this day Good Friday? Well, let me introduce some $10 words to you that you ultimately answer this question. Penal Substitutionary Atonement. These three words explain fully why this bleak day in human history is rightfully called Good Friday. Let's break it down, starting with the first word, penal. Penal, or penalty, is simply a word that embodies the punishment for offenses. Ephesians 2.1 tells us that we are dead in our trespasses and our sins. God is the prosecutor and judge. The verdict is out. We're guilty. And the only justice for sin is a penalty. In this case, the case of rebellion towards and rejection of God, the penalty is most certainly death. This isn't panning out to be a Good Friday so far, is it? Let's try the next word. Substitutionary or substitute describes the replacement of one thing with another. In this case, one person with another. You may recall the story of Abraham and his beloved son, Isaac, from Genesis chapter 22. Early one morning, God tested Abraham by telling him to take his only son to the mountains of Moriah and to give him as a burnt offering, an offering in which the entire offering was consumed with fire and offered to God as a sign of faith and trusting in him. Now, as we know, when they arrived to Moriah and built the altar for the sacrifice, right as Abraham, through tears and sweat, is about to plunge his dagger into his one and only son, what does God do? What does God provide? He provides a substitute, a ram without blemish, without defect. You see, in the same way, we are all lambs being led to slaughter, except we are not without blemish. As we just learned, we are dead in our sins, awaiting our trial and execution. But as he told Abraham to take his one and only son to be sacrificed, God sent his one and only son to be our sacrifice, our substitute. And this leads us to our final word, atonement. A big word that simply means the reconciling of sin through punishment, the payment for the penalty. You see, although God is all mercy, all grace, and all love, he is also perfectly holy and righteous and just. This means God cannot allow for sin to remain unpunished. It would be against his holy nature. Sin must be atoned for. It must be reconciled. This is the word that brings the good into Good Friday. Jesus is God, but he is also fully man, and he was the only man to ever live a life in perfect harmony and obedient to God's righteous law. The only person to ever live whom God's law could not condemn because of his perfection. It was he who was sent to the cross on our behalf, a perfect lamb without blemish, given by the Father as a means to atone for the sins of the world. 1 Peter 2, 4 says that he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. For by his wounds, you were healed. Now, as we put these three words together, we learn the most remarkable truth. Although we stand before the eternal judge, guilty and due a penalty we could never pay, God gave his only son as a substitute to take the wrath of God upon his shoulders, atoning for our sins and thus reconciling us to God. It's not just a good Friday. It's the best Friday of all. So as we head into Good Friday, reflect on your life, reflect on your sin, and remember what Christ did so that you may have eternal peace and communion with God. What a good Friday it is.